One Piece is about to deliver a series-changing moment of historical proportions, but among that, you may have missed what may be one of the biggest plot twists in the story, the fact that the Gorosei may all actually be a single person sharing one single brain, existing as satellites or rather planets just like Vegapunk does. However, hear me out until the end, because this chapter also brings a lot of other details and easter eggs we need to break down, including Vegapunk's truth about the world, so let's break down this historically important One Piece chapter together. Firstly though, there's a new cover story that is beginning, one that opens up with returning to Onigashima. It appears that Momo used his powers to drop the island into the depths of Wano's waters, in order to get it out of sight, landing next to the old Wano country. This would infer that the cover story will focus on someone who is found within Onigashima at the moment and who might make their escape from the island. Both Drake and Hawkins supposedly died with within the island. Hawkins mentioned his unlikelihood to survive as he dropped dead, while Drake also didn't reappear during any of the celebrations. But more tellingly, Prince Cruz mentioned even weeks after that that it was impossible to get in contact with Drake, leading him to believe the worst had happened, meaning he might really be dead as well. There are, however, other important characters that would have potentially been left inside the island. We have all the Tobiropo, including Ulti, Page One, Sasaki, and Black Maria, but as Delford users, if they were dumped into the water like this, then they might as very well be dead as well. There is a single exception, however, which would be Jack. King and Queen were knocked out of the island, which caused them to get seized by Ryokugi later, but Jack was defeated within Onigashima, and so if he was left there, then he would have survived, because he is, after all, a fishman, a fact that was confirmed in his Viver card as being a giant grouper fishman, a fish that is usually of massive proportions, hence why Jack is so incredibly tall. As a Alfred user, he cannot move in water, but he is still able to breathe which is how he was able to survive the attack by Zunisha when he was pulled out by his crew who went searching for him underwater. So potentially he could escape from here, but it would require someone to rescue him. Alternatively, this could just be telling us what happened to Onigashima, and then we switch to mainline to focus on a cover story with Yamato, Momonosuke, or any of the other scabbards or characters, so it's hard to say. While we're at it, I'd also like to point out a couple of details from last week's chapter, as I didn't get a chance to talk about it last week. For starters, we got the names for all the remaining Vice Admirals, aside from Vice Admiral Dahl and Vice Admiral Red King, whose name is derived from the Ultraman monster of the same name, and the names we already got of Doberman and Bluegrass, we also got new Vice Admirals, Hound, Guillotine, Tosa, Urban, and Pomsky. Guillotine is the guy who appeared to have an actual blade above his head, likely his guillotine, which he appeared to use in battle. Similarly, Urban also was able to use his hat as an actual cannon when fighting. In this case, you can even see the hand emitting smoke from it as he has just fired a shot. Pomsky, meanwhile, if you remember, appears to have a sea otter Zoan Dalfruit, but there is a more telling pattern among some of these vice admirals, being that many of them are named after dog breeds. Not all of them, but a decent majority. There's Doberman, Hound, Pomsky, and Tosa, which are all dog breeds. Tosa in particular refers to a Japanese breed of fighting dog known for its powerful bite. Hence his attack, Tosa Bite, where he does a Shigan technique with all 10 of his fingers, a technique that was actually already first used by Jabra all the way back in Enya's lobby. There's also Vice Admiral Dalmatian, who is not present at Egghead, and if you want to argue, Garp wearing the dog mask as well. In fact, it's possible that Doll's name may have been a mistranslation all along, as we've never gotten her official romanization from Oda. Rather, it's likely that her name may be Doll, as in D H O L E referring to the dog breed of the same name. This would explain the dog color that she wears at all times, which fits the naming pattern. This naming pattern may seem odd at first, but when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. These vice admirals are literally the lab dogs of the world government, so it makes sense that there would be a constant pattern of dog names among them. Frankie, Bonnie, Kuma, and Atlas are however saved from Tosa by Dori and Brogi, who however don't recognize any of them as straw hats. The joke here, of course, is that they can't recognize Frankie because his bounty poster features the sunny, not his face. Brogi then reacts by giving a wide Green, which is a direct callback to his first appearance over 20 years ago, in an almost identical panel with the sound effect Nika above him, as Nika is the Japanese sound effect for smiling or laughing. 
They also bring up that Vegapunk is the man that Scholar mentioned, with that Scholar likely being Sol, who must have become a Scholar at Elbaf after everything that happened at Ohara. If you recall, Vegapunk paid Sol a visit to peruse the books of the Library of Ohara. It's quite the contrast when you think about it, as the country bumpkin personality Sol first had is contrasted by him now being a full-fledged Scholar, by learning through the books of Ohara. Doll also brings up Sol with blue grass later in this chapter, which indicates that she is a lot older than she first appears, as Sol left the Marines 22 years ago, meaning that Doll is at least around her later 30s or 40s. Some of the giants also bring up a sky island, which brings up the possibility of what many have speculated, that Elbaf has a sky island of its own, like the whole story of Jack and the Beanstalk and all. Back to Luffy's sign, however, Saturn has transformed in what appears to be his beast form of his Ushi-Oni mythical power, where he now appears a lot more beastly and is able to melt things with a poison on his legs. And this is up to par with the Ushi-Oni myth, as it is said the Ushi-Oni is able to conjure poisons, which makes Saturn quite dangerous. The dead appearance of his eyes may also have been inspired by the famous painting of Saturn by Francisco de Goya, which bears a similar depiction of the soulless eyes of the god Saturn. It's also quite fitting for Sanji to mention losing your humanity when talking about Saturn, given the past that he has with his family. Luffy stops both Saturn and Kizaru in an incredible panel where he turns giant, which will be quite fitting as he might meet Dory and Brogy in this state seeing each other eye to eye. At the same time, this is a very thematically meaningful moment, as we see the contrast between Sabaody Luffy, who had to run away unable to protect any of his crewmates, versus Egghead Luffy, now able to stop both a marine admiral and an elder planet all on his own. Sanji attempts to get Vegapunk out of the scene, but Kizaru uses his Amano Murakumo to pierce Vegapunk and kill him for good. At this point, it seems that Vegapunk is truly dead, as we can see in his lab a heart rate monitor going beep, beep, until it flatlines, indicating that his heart has stopped beating entirely. Vegapunk is even smiling, which is a pattern in One Piece that has been shown in those whose dreams have been inherited and will come to pass through the actions of others. In other words, not truly dying because you are being remembered. This pattern is often misassociated with the D-Clan, but plenty of non-D-Clan members have smiled during their deaths, so it ties more with a general theme of dying happy because you know that you will live on through others. Because you know that your will will live on through others. This does bring into question though if Vegapunk is truly dead or if he was able to upload his consciousness to the cloud into punk records in some way or another. Either way, Lilith, Edison, and Atlas should still be able to live, seeing as how Shaka and Pythagoras' deaths didn't really affect their status, and even Edison seems to be doing just fine the next chapter. And there's also the fact that York should still be stuck in the lab of face, alongside Kako as well, if you recall, which may pose a threat if the government can seize her, since she is the only other one able to create the mother flame energy cells that power the ancient weapon Imu possesses, what we believe to be Uranus, by process of elimination at this point. However, Vegapunk's death triggers a pre-recorded message, which is sent all over the world. This message is achieved through a new technology of language Denden Mushi, which are able to broadcast all over the world. These were introduced during film Red, where Uta had found on the shores of Elysia a shipwrecked vessel of the SSG, Vegapunk's special science group, which housed some prototypes of this long-range Denden Mushi that essentially allowed to livestream footage all over the world. Uta used those to host her concerts, but that was Oda's way of introducing this technology that Vegapunk would now use to divulge the secrets of the world. This likely is the world-changing event of the Egghead incident has been teased for so long. What are these secrets, though? Well, the possibilities are infinite, but at the very least, I'd have to imagine, it has to be something capable of damaging the world government, especially with the desperation the Gorosei appear to be having. As hype as it would be for us One Piece readers, things like the name of the ancient kingdom, what I would personally believe to be the Kingdom of D, the Kingdom of Dawn, or more details about Nika, wouldn't really rile up the people of the world that much. I mean, yeah, sure, there was this ancient superhero or this ancient kingdom that got beaten, but would that really put much of an effect? I mean, think about it. What is the biggest secret the world government is hiding? What is the most dangerous thing they are not allowed to divulge at all costs? Quite simply, that is the 
identity of the national treasure of Marijuana, King Emu. This is a detail I've talked about before, but it's something that has been lost in translation, where Doflamingo talked about a certain national treasure of Marijuana, but in the Japanese version, he referred to that treasure as the one who is really actually ruling the world in secret. This was mistranslated because at the time of the release of this chapter, there was no context about Emu's existence, but now with hindsight, it's very easy to realize that Doflamingo was talking about this living national treasure, the greatest secret of the world government, which is what he was able to do to blackmail CP0, as they were willing to do anything to keep Doflamingo shut. So evidently, this has to be Imu's identity. Doflamingo even mentioned to Law that his plan was using the Ope Ope no Mi's personality switching operation to become the national treasure himself. In other words, Doflamingo wanted to swap bodies with Imu to become king of the world, but that obviously didn't come to pass. But regardless, this living national treasure called as such because he's literally been living for the past 800 years, is the biggest secret in the government's history and something that, as Doflamingo himself has said, could shake the world to its core if it came to be known publicly. As such, if Vegapunk divulged this secret right now, it would completely crumble the image of the world government. If Sabo Killing Cobra led 12 nations out of 170 in the world government to revolt, imagine what would happen if everyone found out that they were being controlled by this ancient entity. No wonder that the Gorosei are so desperate. This brings into question how Vegapunk knew, as Saban Dragon wouldn't have been able to tell him in time, but it's possible that Ohara may have discovered something about how Emu became king 800 years ago and came to the conclusion he's still around, and Vegapunk read about that in the library of Ohara. At least it's something Oda can likely justify in many ways. I know some fans may be disappointed, especially with how important it is that Sabo and Vivi may know, but I still think it could make sense, but again, it could be something else entirely, and at the very least, I'd have to imagine that Oda would have to pair it with some new lore or something to impact readers as well. Either way, our answers won't be so immediate, as Vegapunk decides to take 10 minutes in order to let others prepare for the livestream, so I suppose we shall take our real-life couple weeks as well to prepare ourselves for it. Uh, hopefully, it's only a couple of weeks. We then cut to the Holy Land Marijua, where it appears to be nighttime. This actually kind of kills a long standing theory that it's always day in Marijua, just like Ennis Lobby, as we had always seen the Holy Land during the day, leading some to think that it may have gone through a similar phenomenon as Ennis Lobby since the God Country existed here before Marijua. But I suppose that's not the case, as it does appear to be nighttime, which makes sense since Marijua is found in a different time zone from Egghead as, after all, the Grand Line runs horizontally to the equator, in a time zone where it is still night, though the Gorosei are definitely wide awake. We then cut to Dress Rosa, where it is currently day, where we see a flamenco dancer dancing among the streets. In the Royal Palace, we see Rebecca training with Kiros, growing stronger, and with her are Leo, who gullibly believed the news, a transformed Kabu, and head of the guard, Stan Klepanto. We then get to Fusha Village, where they mention not having a visual Dan Dan Mushi. Interestingly, Whoop Slap wonders why a visual is needed beyond the audio, which makes me wonder if Megapunk may showcase something visual visually as well. It's also interesting to hear him mention that they don't have the money for a visual Denden Mushi, which may help illustrate some of the financial struggles that Fusha Village may suffer being part of the segregated Goa Kingdom. At Water 7, where it's still night, Iceberg is being waken up by his secretary, whose name is revealed to be Alice. It's written as Alice, but it's pronounced Alice, as it's an Italian name. As was shown during cover stories, she's the new secretary that applied after Khalifa, who is a genius prodigy capable of managing things perfectly. Sitting on her head, we also see Iceberg's pet mouse, Tyrannosaurus, donning his suit as well. At the World Economic Newspaper, we can also see Morgans, Vivi, and Wapple reacting, with the latter looking completely uninterested in the situation. Next to him is also Yaneno Chinode, a character that was named in an SBS as the one who gave Vivi her clothes as she has a crush for her, which we see here again fawning over Vivi. 
Plenty of other locations are also showcased, with fittingly themed towns such as a cold location in the North Blue and a tropical location in the South Blue, typical of those oceans. In Kamabaka, on a special decorated screen, Ivankov is shocked by Vegapunk's cat head as he hasn't seen him in the past four years, while Dragon recalls Shaka's words that Vegapunk might lose his life, so he may have gotten in as to what is happening, though once again this kills any chances of Dragon being an egghead unless he can get there almost instantly. Back at Egghead, Luffy fights back against Kizaru and Saturn by squashing them into dough, in a move he calls Don Symbols, referring to how he squashes them like symbols. The kanji reading instead reads as directional force, given the force that he is applying to squash them. He then tosses them around like pizzas and throws them around, with Kizaru crashing onto a battleship. Kizaru then appears to be tearing up, likely after having to have killed the Vegapunk and regretting his actions, even though he had no other choice. Saturn, however, comes back like a spinning boomerang in quite the cartoonish fashion. This actually lines up with Emu's powers being quite cartoonish as well, which suggests the idea that Emu and the Gorosei, by extent, are a bit of a parallel to Nika. While Nika is cartoonish and goofy, they are cartoonish but sinister, like the heroes and demonic villains of a cartoon. However, all tables are turned around as suddenly Saturn summons the other Gorosei by his side, with all five elder planets the pawing upon Egghead, with the chapter's final editor Kamen mentioning the planets are aligning. We already saw that Saturn is able to use a satanic circle to spawn upon the island from his ship, but he evidently needed to make the journey himself and get there presently before doing so. However, the Gorosei are able to summon each other at any time within their vicinity, and so in this emergency, all five are deploying upon Egghead. This means we are likely to see all of their devil fruit forms that were first teased in chapter 1085, likely all to be themed after the demonic creatures of different mythologies, so uh, get your final bets on what they'll be right now. What's most shocking about this, however, is the connection that the Gorosei have together. Even with the demonic powers of an Ushioni being able to summon each other like this would go against what we know about Devil Fruits. Obviously, Emu, who many of us believe to be the source and origin of Devil Fruits, the Devil himself, had a part in these powers, but something still doesn't add up, because we see that the Gorosei are also able to communicate telepathically. This isn't through Denden Mushi, as Saturn isn't holding any, and the speech bubble is that for inner thoughts, not the one used for transmissions, meaning that they literally share a common consciousness and inner thoughts. Maybe they could even be sharing the same brain. Does this technology sound familiar? Because it's similar to what Vegapunk uses. Though he only applies this once a day with punk records, the brains of the punks all synchronize and they share their memories and thoughts, allowing them all to share one brain, even if their own personalities and experiences differ from each other, still making them their own slightly distinct persons. But if Vegapunk got most of his scientific discoveries from the Void Sentry, then someone must have used this technology in the past as well. This could very much be the case with the five elder planets, five different aspects who, despite having slightly different personalities, all share the same interests and alignments, which is how they are able to work together so efficiently. This even potentially recontextualizes why they always just seem to be talking amongst themselves, expositioning things that they should already know, because it's literally just all one big internal monologue, it's like when you speak with yourself and think about things, which also explains how they are able to follow up on each other's sentences so seamlessly all of the time, it's all essentially the same line of thought, spoken by the same person, just in different bodies. After all, Vegapunk's clones are called the satellites, and the five elder planets are by definition, satellites that orbit around a celestial body as well. In this geocentric model, that would be the Earth, symbolized by the mother of nature, the sea, Umi. And so what would be the Stella, the star that everything, all of this orbits around, the central body from which these satellites originate? It would be none other than King Emu himself. 
And thinking about it, it makes perfect sense. Characters like Saturn are still their own character with their own personality and own spitefulness, but it helps build Emu as a final villain if everything that Kuma and other characters have suffered through came as a result of his direct responsibility, without taking away our hatred for Saturn as well. This also means that one of the main villains was still introduced as early as Jaya, just that we only saw the aspects of Emu with the main body only being revealed so much later in the story. And it makes sense that unlike Vegapunk, where he had the good and the evil, the wise and the greedy, you know, all these aspects of a varied personality. In the case of Emu, most of his aspects just showcase different aspects of evil. There is no good amongst the Gorosei because Emu's heart has always been pure evil. This would also perfectly explain how all of them appear to be perennially youthful and share so many powers together. We already saw how Saturn looked the exact same at God Valley 38 years ago, meaning he has had the perennial youth surgery just like Emu. But if they are all the same person across different bodies, it would make sense how the perennial youth was able to extend as well. Especially if maybe these are special bodies that Emu has synthesized to be able to infinitely regenerate and have special properties. It all makes so much perfect sense, and if Vegapunk were to detail the truth about Emu and potentially his satellites too, then this would be the perfect time to reveal all of that. Which would mean that what we are witnessing here isn't just a formidable foe, we are fighting what could very well be the main antagonist of the series, as an event of historical proportions is coming our way. Before we wrap up though, the latest SBS release, so I thought I'd mention all the relevant questions really quickly as a special bonus here. In this week's edition of Oda's Wacky Drawings, we got Saint Figurland Garling if he didn't cut his hair, Ivankov if he had actually eaten Kaido's dull fruit at God Valley, and Roger's sword if it was a person. We get the names for a few extra background characters, starting with Vice Admiral Hototogisu, who was seen in Kobe's flashback when Garp was instructing them, but also made a cameo in Law's flashback as she works under Tsuru's squad. Like several female marines, her name is derived from a bird species. Then we have Linaria, the captain of the Night Butterfly Pirates, a member of Shanks' fleet who was saved by him as a kid, which inspired her to become a pirate by the epithet of Kindled Linaria, someone known for firing things up, very literally, and thus may likely be a pun on the Lunaria race. Finally, we have Winter Cuisine Komakov, who is one of the elite Yon Cooks, or uh, Yon Yoricho in Japanese, the four head chefs of Marine Headquarters. He is the one who prepared food for Kizaru and Saturn aboard their ship due to the importance of the escort. And some more random details, Kuma's bare heirs are revealed to actually just be his hair, the ship of Cross Guild is revealed to be called the Big Top Blaster, and we get the hobbies of the Sword members. Drake likes reptiles and astrophysics, Kujaku likes taming others and making sweets, Gruz likes solo camping and dancing, Kobe likes sea fishing and training, Hibari likes photography and pouch collecting, and Helmepo likes fashion and walk and eating. Finally, the most interesting question is regarding Mihawk's past, where Oda elaborates by saying, Mihawk's past tells the tale of a grudge towards marines and of a man who has suffered a great betrayal. In that regard, as Crocodile said, they have something in common, being lonely in the sense of having a distrust for others and being someone who is already getting tired of life. As a warlord, at least you didn't get chased around by marines, so I like to think he joined for that sense of peace and tranquility. With that said, now that he's lost the place to be, he's getting around it by staying in the shadow of Buggy. That's all for this bonus SBS question, see you next week as we begin to unveil the secrets of the world.